All right, we'll get going. <clears throat> Welcome. So this talk is uh, the next frontier in open source Java compilers, the just-in-time compilation of the service. So hopefully everyone here is familiar with Java. I hope so. That's me. I approved that picture. Rich Haggerty, IBM developer advocate. So we all understand Java, the underlying JVM, and the JIT, how that works. The Java code is sent to the JVM for execution. The JVM uses the JIT to compile code in an optimized way. And as time goes on, your code is optimized and runs better and better. That's the theory, OK? With that in mind, that's what the talk is about today. So we're going to talk about the problem, which is Java on cloud, specifically distributed architectures like microservices serverless. Then we're going to talk about the reason this is a problem, and that is because of the JVM and the JIT, which has a lot of great things, but also is the reason behind the issues we're going to have. And then we're going to talk about a solution, which is JIT as a service. So again, let's talk about Java on cloud. Is it a good fit? So first, we need to talk about where Java came from. Java is all, around, all about monoliths. And that's when you had a dedicated server, tons of memory, tons of CPUs. This thing would run forever. Um, it never went down. It didn't matter that it took 15 minutes to start up because you never started it up. It just never went down. Um, you would upgrade maybe every six months, one year. That's the old model. So now we want to move to microservices, cloud native applications with our Java application, right? So now we're running in containers. Now we're managed by a cloud platform like Kubernetes. And we need scaling. We need to scale to meet demand. So the, mo the main motivators we have for moving to the cloud, the obvious ones. It's going to be so flexible, so scalable, it's going to be perfect, right? Easy to roll out new releases independently of others, especially with microservices, right? We can update one without affecting the other. Take advantage. So once you're on the cloud, all the new innovations that are coming off the cloud, we can take advantage. Less infrastructure we need to keep and manage. Saving money, that's the big one. That's the theory. So here's the problem. It gets down to performance versus cost and why this is so hard with Java. So there's only really two variables with the, um, regarding costs. Is, is one is the size of your container, and the other is how many of those instances you need to run. It's all related to resources. What are you going to get charged for? So in this case, we're looking at cost and performance. So right here, we've got minimal cost. We probably undersize our containers. We're not running enough instances basically not spending a lot of money, totally unacceptable performance, right? So we may add, um, we may boost it up, run a couple more instances, but it's still not very efficient. We're just spending more money, but still not performing correctly. And obviously, the worst case is we make oversized containers. We have too many running. We're spending lots of money. Performance is very good, but you're not going to like the cost. So this is a sweet spot. Very, very hard to do. In fact, there's a lot of companies are putting a lot of effort into trying to figure out a Java solution for that. And that's why I'm here. So the JVM and the JIT compiler, the good and the bad. So we're going to get to the reasons behind all this, why it's so hard to do. So the JVM itself has been around for 25 years at least. Device independent, right? That's the whole promise of Java. You have a JVM on an architecture, you can run your same Java code without change. The JIT produces optimized machine code. So when your JVM starts up your application, it takes that code, it runs profilers into your code, it looks at the inputs of your, your methods, it determines, okay, these are the hot methods, let's compile those, and it can compile them multiple, multiple times. And your code becomes very, very efficient. We have very efficient garbage collection, the JVM. That's why your code can run for years. Um, the longer it runs, the better it gets. So the bad. So that initial execution of your Java application is interpreted. Hopefully everyone knew that, right? 
bite by bite, very slow, relatively slow, until those methods can be compiled. The hot spots are identified. In fact, the uh, Oracle JVM uh, is called hotspot. So we that identifies a profile that identifies the hotspots and says, let's go build that, let's compile that, that, that method with the JIT. The issue is this initial loading of the JIT and compiles can cause uh, CPU spikes, lowers your quality of service. Memory spikes cause out of memory issues, including crashes. The end result, very slow startup, very low ramp up. Startup is the time it takes for your job application to be able to service the request. That could be during the initial interpreted phase. Ramp up is the time it takes for your JVM to identify what methods need to be compiled, and it compiles all those fully optimized. That's the difference between startup and ramp up time. So here's an example of what happens with your JVM. These are your spikes associated with those initial compiles. Here's your memory footprint. So we need to find that sweet spot, which is getting that container to be just the right size to handle those spikes, but not wasting time, wasting space. And we need efficient auto scalers. So let's revisit those again, now that we know more about what's happening in the background. Here's the problem. <clears throat> we will always over-provision, okay? We're gonna run tests on this container. We're gonna find out we need to, uh, Let's set up this container to be right about here to handle these spikes. The problem is 90% of your code is, is running down here. So as soon as we get past this level of, 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 of spikes, we're wasting space. So you're always gonna over-provision, just the way it is. Plus JVMs are very, they're, they're non-deterministic, meaning you run the same code twice, you're gonna get different spikes at different levels. So we have slow startup and ramp up times. Um, for the container and, oh, I'm sorry, this is for auto scaling. Scaling is not going to be efficient, right? You have microservices that you want to scale up and down based on demand. It's not going to work very well if your startup times are too slow, your, 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 your ramp up times are not very slow. It has to be quick, right? Demand comes on, you need four more instances of your microservice. Well, it takes 10 seconds for them to start up each. It's going to be too slow. Users are going to know. Also, CPU spikes can cause auto scalers to uh, give you false positives. So auto scalers are based on metrics like CPU utilization. So if you say anytime my CPU gets over 50%, fire up another instance, if you're telling Kubernetes this or the auto scaler, your, your JVM may start up and start compiling and go over 50%. So it hasn't actually processed anything, but it's over 50%, so it's gonna fire up another instance. And that's not right and it's gonna thrash about, it's gonna kill them off, bring them back, so it's gonna be very inefficient. So solution, we gotta minimize, eliminate CPU and memory spikes. We gotta improve startup and ramp up times. Very easy, right? That's all we gotta do. That's where the JIT as a service comes in. So here's the theory behind the remote JIT. We want to have our, whoops, Come on, I apologize. This is our normal JVM. We wanna have remote JITs that we can access remotely. So we offload the JIT compilations to the remote services, right? These are gonna be managed just like any other microservice by your orchestrator, Kubernetes. It's basically your classic mono to micro solution. In this case, the monolith is a JVM. Now we're splitting that in, into a JIT and whatever's left into two microservices. The other thing is the, J, the JIT is still available in a local JVM. So if this goes down for any reason, the JVM could still function. So we're basically treating our JIT compilation as a cloud service. So does that exist? It does, and it's actually a part of the OpenJ9 JVM. And it's called JIT Server, also known as Samru Cloud Compiler. Um, OpenJ9, does everyone know what OpenJ9 is? So, open, so um, OpenJ9 is a JVM that's been around. Uh, well, I'm gonna talk about it here in a second. So 
initially over 25 years ago, IBM came out with the J9 JVM. So IBM identified early on that Java was going to be very popular. They wanted to make sure that it worked on all of their devices. So from their handheld scanners to their mainframes. So they built their own JVM. It's called J9. About five or six years ago, they said, we're going to open source it to Eclipse. And now it's called the Open J9. And it's distributed with IBM's distribution of the Open JDK. So everyone here, if you've never heard of Open J9, I assume you are using Oracle JVM Hotspot, if you're using Java. So just to let you know, Open J9 is built for small containers. It's built for the cloud. Um, here's some testing we have going against Hotspot. So these are just, it's basically half the size, half the, um, it ramps up faster, uses less memory. So Open J9 comes with um, IBM's distribution of Java, which is called SAMRU runtimes. Okay, so I don't know if you're aware. It used to be you get JD, you get Java from Oracle or Sun if you're really old. But um, they, it was open source about 10 years ago. There's been different distributions of of now. There's multiple uh, players that dis distributed, right? There's um, Amazon, Coretto. Um, Oracle has theirs, Red Hat has theirs, Microsoft has a version, IBM has a version. It's called Samaru Runtimes. And if you're wondering what the name is, Samaru is the tallest mountain on the island of Java. So that's the, the correlation there. So what advantages do you get with a JIT server from a client standpoint? So if I'm a JVM accessing this JIT, now it's going to be a lot easier for me to provision the container. Right? We don't worry about those spikes anymore. So we used to have to provision up here to handle the spikes. Now we just worry about the actual container size or what the application needs. We're going to get improved ramp up time um, because the JIT server is doing all that hard work. Reduce CPU consumption. The cost, you're going to reduce your memory cost. We're going to show that here in a minute. We did a couple of experiments. Um, and you're going to get a lot more efficient auto scaling. So the scaling is going to be correct. It's going to be uh, based on demand instead of based, not based on, oh, the compiles caused you to, to start um, erroneous instances. And resilient, if the JIT server does go down, the JVM still has access to its own local JIT. So we did a test. Um, this is an example of um, the size of containers so we basically took four big Java applications, and we, we created multiple instances of each. And we scaled them, the container size, such that they would perform well. And we put that on to, onto AWS, I think, on OpenShift. Uh, yeah. And this is what we came up with. So this is kind of hard to read. But the top one is our baseline. This is without the JIT server. Okay. So we have five applications that all have the same color. So example AM is the Acme Air monolith application. We determined we need to have 500 megs to run efficiently. And we're going to have eight instances of that. And if we do that and we ask um, OpenShift, which is our um, platform we're using, to lay that out, it says, OK, we're going to need three nodes of this size to, to run what you, what you want to run. Then we introduce the JIT server which is right here. This bottom row is the JIT server. So the JIT server itself is, is the biggest application in the node. See how big it is? But even with that, all of our applications almost shrunk in half. So we have the same number of instances running. Even with the JIT server, we, we're now using 2 thirds of the, the allocated memory. If you're wondering how they perform against each other, Basically, it's a wash. They both perform the same. Um, here's an example of auto scaling. Um, again, with the JIT servers in blue, you're going to see that the dips aren't as, as severe, and it comes back up and ramps up a lot faster. I want to show you a demo real quick. So here's a demo. We're going to take three applications. We're going to take one application and run three instances of it. It's called Acme Air, and we're going to run it in containers. 
The first one's going to have 400 meg. second one's going to have 200. The third one is also only going to have 200, but it's going to have access to the JIT server. The top two is not. So these are on their own. The bottom guy gets that. So this MongoDB is used by the application. The rest of this stuff, all these containers are just needed for the, um, for the test. So they're going to gather metrics and, and they're going to display them. So let me go ahead and show that at work. I got this all running right before this started. Hopefully everything's still there. All right, so all the containers are all running. I'm gonna go ahead and start up my Acme Air. So I'm now gonna fire up those three containers. And then I'm gonna run JMeter, which is gonna apply load to each one of those. Okay. I don't know if you can read that. Hopefully you can. So this is what that, that Acme Air container thing is. So right here, I'm running three versions. You can see the three Docker runs. The first one has 400 meg. Second one has 200. The bottom one also has 200, but it has this extra JVM argument that says, go ahead and use the JIT server. That's the difference. So now we'll go over to We have Grafana running some graphs back on what's going on. So this is CPU throughput to tell you how efficiently everything's running. The top graph, these two are running without JIT server. This one's running at 400. This one's running at 200. This guy is running with the JIT server at 200. And notice how fast this guy ramps up, even more than this one. It's ramping quickly. This one, running at 200, is never going to really get very far, right? Um, in fact, probably nothing's being compiled because the JVM is pretty smart in saying, I'd like to compile these methods, but you don't have enough memory. I'm not going to cause an out-of-memory issue. So we'll just shut it down. We're just going to run interpreted. You're not going to be very efficient, so it's going to run that way. So these guys are eventually going to get to very optimized state, both of these. But this one's doing it on half the memory. That's the key takeaway, right? We got the JIT server running. We're using half the memory. Oops, sorry. So this is a graph in case the demo failed. This is my backup plan. So how to use it, um, it's basically real simple. I don't know if you picked up on this, but basically the JIT server is just an, another instance of the JDK, OpenJ9. So you can run the JVM normally, like you run a Java My App, or you can run it as JIT server. It's just a different persona of the same OpenJ9 JVM. Um, <clears throat> full list of options of open, um, again, it's open source under Eclipse, so there's a whole list of uh, options you can run with it. Um, the key point here is we, we do have a certified operator, so OpenShift operators, I don't know if you guys are into those, Kubernetes, uh, it makes life so much simpler. Um, so we have a certified operator for Open Liberty, which uses OpenJ9, and you can, it's as easy as uh, there's an enable flag, and you just say, I want to use a JIT server, and you just get it. There's not much you have to do. There's no calls you need to make. Um, it's just the startup of the JVM that's different. Diff um, obviously, there's a lot of parameters you can run with some, uh, we don't recommend you using um, any, let's see. I'm sorry, I had a thought that just escaped me. Uh, encryption, you wanna, um, it does add to the network latency. Um, so we, you shouldn't be using too much of that. If you, if you can get away with it, don't use it. Um, 
It does, uh, it does provide some metrics back to Prometheus if you want to track how it's doing. You typically want to use 10 to 20 clients per JIT server, right? So that's key. You notice in that one graph we showed, it was the biggest container. Well, you need to connect to a lot of clients to make up for that. Um, and you do need to make it pretty big here, one to two gig of RAM. And you don't want to start everything at the same time. You want to stagger the starts. You don't want to start 20 clients at the same time using the same JIT server. Um, there's another feature. I had another talk where I, I talked about serverless. And um, instant on is another feature of OpenJ9. So one of the benefits of, of OpenJ9 is that both IBM and Red Hat are fully vested into this open source JVM. And they're coming out with really good technologies, like the JIT server. Um, by the way, as anyone, I, I talked about different vendors providing different solutions. Um, the OpenJ9 JIT server solution is the only open source version uh, solution out there. There are other solutions just like this, but they're proprietary. Um, also on the um, instant on is another feature of OpenJ9, which basically takes your job application, takes a snapshot, and then you could start from that point, and it starts up instantaneously in milliseconds as opposed to seconds. Most job applications take five to 10 seconds. We can get that down into the 300 millisecond time frame. There's also different solutions for that. Um, different vendors are coming out with, but they're, again, they're proprietary. They're not open source. Um, so instant on is another feature that's come out that addresses serverless. But instant on can be combined with JIT server. So those containers that you create that scale up and down um, can be instant on images, and they could start instantaneous. I was going to show you if I had, I think that's it, okay. So, so final thoughts, if, uh, the JIT does provide a great advantage, but the compilation is the problem, right? That's the problem with Java. So if we disaggregate the JIT from the JVM, we're making a JIT compilation of the service. That's what we're proposing as a good solution. Um, the Eclipse Open J9 JIT server is also known as the Samru Cloud Compiler. It's available now on Linux, Java 8, 11, 17, um, and it's distributed with the IBM Samru runtimes. So it's great for constrained environments. You're only going to want to use this with, with uh, um, containers and microservice architectures. Um, it works seamlessly with Kubernetes, and it's going to improve your ramp up time, auto scaling performance and it's gonna reduce your memory footprint. So you're gonna, it's all about, we talked earlier about the motivations for moving to cloud. And one of the things a lot of people find out is they don't save a lot of money because of resources. It's using more resources than they thought they'd need. And one of the big reasons is because you don't know how to provision right. Um, you're, you need to provision for worst case scenarios. And all we're doing with solutions like that is eliminating those. And you can work, uh, work to get those costs down. Um, that QR code points to an, a series of uh, articles um, and blogs around this technology and using it in different environments like Kubernetes. Um, anyway, that's the end of my talk, but thank you. Thank you for coming. I know it's late. Did I get done in time? Yeah, I think I did. Any questions? Yes. I heard Quarkus. I can repeat the question. I think he said something about uh, if it works with Quarkus, or is it an alternative to Quarkus? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, did you try to use it with Quarkus, and uh, how does it perform uh, comparing with GraalVM? Oh, so, so there, okay. I alluded to that earlier. So GraalVM has a couple of solutions like that, right? So GraalVM has a crack um, a service. They have, uh, so the underlying restore feature for the instant on instantaneous comeback is the underlying um, 
It's, it's a Linux, fe Linux feature called CryU, Checkpoint Restore in User Space. Um, that technology has been around a while. You can use that with Linux processes. You can say run, freeze, or stop, take a snapshot, come back later, start right from that point. Same thing is applied to images that are put in containers. So a couple of different vendors have used that. Um, so Quarkus has a, another feature. Um, it's called static compilation. Is that what you're talking about, Graal VM? So the point about that is they've decided, OK, Java isn't fast enough. We're never going to get it fast enough. Let's compile statically beforehand. So they take a static compile, like your C program. They get an executable, very small, runs fast, and then they run that. The problem is it's not built. It's, you lose the JVM. You don't have a JVM anymore. All the things that are nice about JVMs are gone. Garbage collection, all that. So it, it doesn't work very well with short-lived. Um, with long-running applications, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, so it has a place. Um, but you have to take a whole new framework, right? So I got my Java. I got my process set up. And OK, for this thing, we're going to build Quarkus. It's a new framework. We compile differently. How does that fit into our CI, CD pipeline? How do we test that? Java developers are going to compile their code. They're going to run in a JVM. And now we have to release this thing in, and we have to have a whole set of tests around it. So it makes your life more complicated. So that's, that's my pitch. Um, but I understand, I mentioned that, that green spot. It's very hard to, to get that right. And a lot of vendors are coming up with solutions. And that's one solution, saying, Java just doesn't work. Um, we're going to compile it ahead of time. All the cool features of Java, dynamic loading and all that stuff, you can't do, by the way. You have to have a very small subset of Java. You have to compile it ahead of time and then run it that way. But that's it. Yes? So do, the, do all the compilation improvements happen per container? Uh, well, the, the JIT server can service multiple clients. Yeah, that's what I was going to get to. So okay. does it uh, share the yes. optimization? Is that where the power is coming from? Uh, yes, part of it. Okay. Part of it is the initial com compilation. It's, gonna give you, it's basically giving you CP cycles because it's doing the compilation. Yes. But if I have microservice A and I have 10 instances and they're running, they're getting scaled up, the first version of that compiled a bunch of its methods and the JIT server has those. Now, the second instance comes along and says, hey, I need this. I already got it. So it sends it right back. So that any new container will not have the cold start problem, right? It shouldn't have. Well, no. It will, I, I do want to be careful. Um, not all instances are created equal. So the profile has to match exactly. So the JIT server just knows that it's getting a request for a method. And if it's already got that compiled and the profile matches, it will return that. Otherwise, it's going to compile it again. But even, even if it didn't, compile, didn't have it ready to go, the fact that it's compiling it and your, your container is not is a savings because you have a smaller container. Any other questions? Um, this is not brand new technology either. Now, the Instant On is coming out. Um, OpenJ9 is releasing that soon. I'm not allowed to say when. Very, very soon. The uh, JIT server or com Samaru Cloud Compiler has actually been around about a year and a half, almost two years, right? And we're, uh, it's slowly getting better and better, different use cases, different uh, platforms, uh, cloud platforms. You know, testing stuff from the cloud is very difficult. There's the, the matrix, test matrix is huge. All the different Java versions, all the different uh, cloud platforms with different uh, orchestrators. Um, so it's getting better and better. We're finding issues and we're fixing them. All right, well, that's it. Thank you very much for coming.